Welcome back to the Mobility Project. Day 240, that means one thing, it's time for our 10 minute squat test. One of the things we've tried to do is, in the squat test is get athletes thinking about, hey boy, I'm missing these big natural ranges of motion, okay, check. Uh, it kind of illuminates some mechanical problems with the back, with the hip, with the, with the knees, with the ankles. The other reason is that I want to start and try to initiate a conversation about jumping mechanics and jumping safety. One of the things we're trying to do with getting athletes to have a, a straighter foot forward position is that as we go beyond just squatting and just moving heavy weights, we need to come to understand that default motor programming, default motor planning, if my feet are always turned out when I'm strong, it's the only time I deadlift or swing a kettlebell or front squat or back squat, then when the time comes for me to generate a lot of force, my default motor pattern is always going to be to have the foot turned out. This is a real problem for young athletes, and this is a real problem for people who take something just beyond the gym and actually translate it into contact sports or power sports. Talk to the best NFLers. They'll, they'll talk about the fact that as soon as your feet are turned out, you're broken, unless you're going in that direction, which is a different idea. We want to have feet going straight. If you're a race car, we don't want your race car wheels going in different directions. And one of that problem is that if I land and I teach my athletes to always be strong, then I'm always exposing them to what we call a valgus knee force. In this situation, when I jump and land, if my knee comes in, I'm more likely just to have an MCL strain. I'm more likely to block. Even if we teach young kids to jump and land, we teach them to jump and land with knees together. If they're not strong enough to control the position, they block and are safe. If I'm always teaching my kids to turn their feet out, then as soon as in this position, the leg has gone unlocked. This is the open position of the joint, where the joint is unlocked versus closed, which is what the popliteus does. It locks that knee into position. So if I'm here, then all of a sudden I have an MCL strain, an ACL strain, and a meniscus strain. And this is that magic, horrible thing that happens. This is why we've got to make sure that athletes have enough range of motion. They're not going around the ankle. This is why we have to make sure that athletes have enough hip range of motion, that they're not solving the internal rotation problem by turning the foot out. This is why we make sure that athletes are stable up top. If I am unstable or I'm landing like this, then it also leads to overextension of the back because it's really difficult for me to end up in a good position and still maintain neutral. In this position, I have a lot more options. What we want to do is make sure you understand that if we can start to make sure that our athletes have this availability, then when they jump and land in a cut direction, they can control that leg and control that tibia. So many of the problems when we see young kids jump up and land, that knee automatically comes in. We see too many young female athletes with this control problem and very a lot, a lot of comfort in controlling that slack or the laxity in the knee. So, this is why we're thinking about this, besides the fact that, boy, you automatically are going to default into this. Even if you lose concentration for a second, it's heavy, whoop, that's an ACL valgus strain. Versus, it's heavy, whoop, now I'm just stable, and the knee has locked off as a solid joint, not a twisting solid, unsolid joint. And that's a big deal. It's one of the things I need to think about. When my athletes fail, what position are they going to be in? Is it going to be a catastrophic failure? Because we expect them to fail. So, today... One of the reasons we're talking is we've got to make sure that that ankle is not collapsed. I'm not teaching my athletes. Look at the bottom position. So much stronger. Even just passively, turn the feet in, I collapse, knees collapse. This is what's up. I'm going to put a video up of one of the best athletes on the planet. His name is Ed Cohn. I want you to look at it's a bad failure when he's out of position a little bit. It's really heavy. He's exaggerated his knee problem. That knee comes in today. It's, he's probably got eight or 900 pounds on the bar, maybe over 1,000 pounds. He's a freak show. But I want it's the same thing as a young kid jumping or coming down from volleyball. We take the knee and the ankle seriously. This is an easy way to screen for this. The functional movement screen has athletes squatting, overhead squatting with the feet straight because we can see this magnified instantaneously. So don't let your athletes train that way. This is why coaches like Mike Boyle do a lot of single leg stuff. This is why Eric Cressy does a lot of single leg stuff because we can get our athletes to start to be stronger and have control this way. That's the thinking. Today's mission. Get your feet straight, and then what I want you to do as we've advanced this is I want you to figure out why you can't get your feet straight. Is it your ankle range of motion, you're going around it? Is it your hip range of motion? What's happening? But we need to be able to get, ultimately, <laughs> have the range of motion and options to be able to handle these positions. The least of which is that it's more powerful, I can generate more torque, I can stabilize my back, hold my torso upright, and suddenly I look like all the beautiful 79 kilo Chinese lifters pulling in a excellently rotated position. That's the goal today. See you tomorrow.